Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello again, welcome back to Fighting on Film. And this week, we are trying something a little different. We're going to be looking at the use of a specific weapon and its portrayal in the war film genre. And what better way to test this new format than with our very own Matthew Moss as our expert guest. So, Matt, welcome to the show. You don't need any introduction. People know who you are around here. Thank you for having me. It's very quite, very kind of you to invite Thanks me on. Thanks for fitting this into your extremely busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> but we are, of course, this week talking about the peer on film. And if you're a fan of Matt's, if you follow him on Twitter, at Historic Firearm, if you bought his book on the peer in 2020, the peer will be no stranger to you. But Matt, for first off, for people who aren't aware of the peer and its development, its usage, can you give us a rundown of how that weapon came about? Absolutely, let's bring it up. So it comes in in 1943. It's basically the, the platoon anti-tank weapon uh, for the infantry. Lots of other elements use it as well. Um, but what it really does is it replaces the boys' anti-tank rifle as the ranged infantry anti-tank weapon. Um, so up until that point, the best they had was the boys, which is a, a 0.55 bolt action rifle. We've seen that in action on the pod in nine men quite oh, recently. Yeah. Uh, and then other than that, they had a plethora of hand grenades, sticky bombs, um, gammon bombs, etc. And they were all designed to, to penetrate armor and, and knock out vehicles. But really, they, they weren't capable of taking on anything over a, a Panzer II, Panzer III in terms of armor because mm. armor was just increasing at such a rapid rate. In 1940, 42, 43, the, the boys anti-tank rifle just, it couldn't penetrate anything uh, over an inch or so at best, really. So it became clear that the, the pit was was something that was needed and it became clear that the, the boys was, was obsolete. And a number of efforts were, were made towards it. And the one that came to fruition was a project that was led by the uh, Ministry of Defence 1 or MD1. Uh, you might know that better as Churchill's toy shop um, okay. and a number of engineers there were working on various different premises and the basic idea of a spigot based weapon evolved from uh, Stuart Blacker's Blacker Bombard the 29 millimeter um, spigot mortar which is best known as being one of the weird artillery yeah. weapons that the uh, the home guard were lumbered with so they say but Blacker Bombar was, although it was heavy, it definitely would have penetrated anything that was going to come up against in 1941, mm. if there had been an invasion. From this spigot idea, the idea for a small shoulder-fired weapon that a man can carry, the Piat is actually a pound lighter than the, the boys. It's slightly lighter, slightly um, more manoeuvrable, although it is a bit cumbersome when you compare it to something like a bazooka, which is essentially just a, a light tube. So... Yeah. What is a spigot? What's a spigot mortar? Where does the big spring come in? Because that's one of the big misconceptions about the pit. It was spring powered. Like the Jeremy Clarkson documentary where he pulls yeah. it up from the ground. And when I was younger, I always assumed, that, oh, that's how they load the pit. Oh my gosh. Like every time they've got to stand on the base plate and pull exactly. it up. Like, but no, that's quite wrong. You know, I think it's funny how that sort of gets misconstrued a lot, I think. Yeah, and, and that's one of the things that films don't tend to show either, so which we'll talk about in a minute. But the spring's there really to soak up the recoil from the 2.5-pound bomb that it's firing. So it's firing a fairly heavy projectile, a fair whack, and the idea of the spring is that compresses, soaks up the recoil, and it recocks the action. So essentially, the pier is a big semi-automatic anti-tank weapon. So it recocks itself. And the way that uh, a spigot mortar works in general is instead of it being a tube or a barrel, which contains the expanding propellant gas, the expanding propellant gas is between the face of the spigot or rod and the interior rear of the bomb. So as the, the, the propellant cartridge is, is fired when the, when the weapon's fired, the gases expand and it pushes the bomb forwards and it expands in the the small chamber, it becomes almost like a piston. Mm. Uh, it, it, the gas is expanding the small chamber that's created by 
the walls of the bomb's tail. So there's a little tube on the back of the Piat bomb and you slide that over the spigot rod. And then when you pull the trigger, firing pin hits the propellant cartridge in the base of the, the, uh, the Piat round. The gases from the, the propellant cartridge expand and that's what throws the bomb down range. And at the same time, the force of that being thrown off also recocks the weapon. So if you didn't have that big spring, it would be extremely painful for the man firing the weapon. So sure. the pier is what is known as a dynamic spigot rather than a fixed spigot. So when we think about a fixed spigot, that's the Blacker Bombard because it's on a big tripod, which is taking up all that recoil from the bomb being fired off. Yeah. But because the pier is supposed to be mobile, shoulder fired, it's it has to have this big spring. Mm. And they did lots of tests to work out just how much a man could withstand in terms of, of um, the punch back from, from firing a pit. They finally tuned it to the point where it was as light as they could get it, but it also soaked up as much as that recoil as possible. Wow. So what, what year did it come into service fully? It made its debut principally in Sicily, but there are photographs of it in Tunisia um, with the small arms school corps. Uh, it seems that some were taken over there and troops were trained on them. I don't know whether any of them saw action towards the end of the Tunisian campaign, but primarily it made its combat debut in Sicily and then in Italy. And it becomes this sort of iconic British weapon of the Second World War, doesn't it? And I think the way it's portrayed in film, I've like, latched itself onto the weapon and it's where all these misconceptions come about. So I think what's best now is if we go through some scenes where the P is used um, in film and then talk about that a little bit. And then we'll pick our favourite, or we'll pick your favourite um, depiction of the pit on film as our guest. Yeah, let's do it. So I think we should start off with 1946's Days is the Glory. So... We actually covered that film on our first episode. That was our very first episode, yeah. Two, two years now, nearly, I think. Yeah, almost, yeah. If you aren't familiar with the film, it's directed by Brian Desmond Hurst in 1946, um, and it's a film about Arnhem. It's filmed in Arnhem. The men who were in the movie were the actual men who dropped into Arnhem. And it's this really mm. special, really beloved film from that immediate post-war era because it's one of the first British movies that depicted the Second World War. And there are two instances in that movie where the pier is used. So, Matt, do you want to talk us through the first instance in the movie where the pier is used? I'm going to say it now. It's probably the best depiction of the pier. Um, but we'll come back to that. Oh, early doors. It, it's actually really incredible. So the first scene that we see it in, the guys are approaching Arnhem to relieve uh, Frost at the bridge, and they encounter some enemy armour. Uh, I think it's a flamethrower tank. Shah B, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they're, they're pinned down. A chap throws a, a gammon, gammon bomb, doesn't quite make the uh, make contact. And one of the guys goes, can we have a crack at it with the pier, sir? Great line. And the, the officer just nonchalantly goes, okay, off you go. They're seen jogging off. They cross the road. They, they flank round, which is exactly what would have been the procedure. And then it cuts to an, a scene where they're, they're just popping out of a hedgerow and a number one and a number two drop down. So number one's on the pier. Number two is there with the bomb carrier. He loads a round in and they fire off, I think, two, maybe three rounds. Two rounds, I think, yeah. Yeah. And they they, they knock out the tank. And that's the first time a pit will have ever been seen on screen outside of a newsreel. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a great little sequence because it's it's the second day of the lift and then it comes straight after Stanley Maxted gives one of his... Yeah, reports. Like he bridges the movie's sequences. So he's like, second yeah. day, men of the second lift are moving up towards Arnhem and they get stopped by the, the armoured vehicles that have come up um, to support mm -hmm. the, the Germans in defence of Arnhem. And it's a great little sequence of, of chaps taking on armour. And then the second instance of the peer in the movie, there, there's a commanding officer, um, and he's got his head in his hand. And by this point in the movie, they're all very dishevelled, and the day look like it might be lost. And a medical orderly comes in, and he goes, oh, sir, I've got a message from the, the Germans at the... Uh, aid station they say we'll bring up tanks and we'll destroy you basically in no uncertain terms it's a sort of an ultimatum that's it yeah and the officer says well um you can tell him and my anti-tank i've got no anti-tank guns he says 
But um, <laughs> if you <laughs> if he brings up a tank, and I'll take him out of my anti tank guns, and then he looks at the the orderly and says, "Well, I haven't got any anti tank guns, but I have got a piet." And he looks at Dixon, the cook, and he goes, "Dixon, have a crack at that tank out there with a piet." And Dixon just picks up a piet and three bombs in the bomb tray and saunters off down the t- bomb damaged hallway <laughs> yeah, it's always like Cub- barely hanging onto the building it, yeah, it's, it's like Kubrick isn't it it's like three point perspective him going down that beautiful shot so, down that hallway it's so great isn't it Desmond Hurst Dixon doing- silhouette sauntering off with the pier and there's a panther tank and it was a knocked out panther um, that was just left there and uh, the way that that film was in- ingeniously made they just thought well it's there we'll use it and Matt thinks that the the round fired by Dixon in that sequence is a real Peter round. I would suspect so because they're all seven soldiers and they're all, they've all taken their service weapons with them. Yes. Um, they've been detached from service, haven't they? I think they were up in Norway. They were. Um, yeah. Cause some chaps actually have number five Lee Enfields that they wish. They do. The they the do. Yeah. They have the, the carbines. Yeah. Um, and so I think really, I, when you think about it, it was a knocked out tank. It had been there for months at that point. Mm. There's no way for them to fire off a pit with, I suppose you could have fired a um, an inert. That would have had the same effect. And um, they could have no. done some pyro uh, there. But I think, I have a suspicion. I'm not, I can't confirm it. I don't know. But I have a feeling that that is an actual shot with a pit onto that panther. It does and go up like smoke, doesn't it? It goes up very... It does, it does. It's a really imp- impactful scene and... The whole setup of that, and he he saunters off to do it, and and then he, he comes back and he says, "What does he say?" He says something like, "There's no future in cooking for me, sir." That's what he that's says. That's it. That's it. Yeah, fantastic little scene. So that happened on uh, the actual event happened on 24th September, and he was a platoon cook, um, and he took on uh, the enemy tank with a couple of scrounged up pit rounds because at that point they're running really really low, and apparently he crept into some bushes about 50 yards short of the tank uh, and he managed to hit it with its first shot amazing in the film he's he's leaning off a i think it's a tiger he makes the shot from behind that as cover which is probably a good idea if he was firing a real round yeah um and yeah and he manages to knock it out um and the vehicle's crew were cut down by uh, soldiers nearby oh wow okay um as they as he tried to escape you don't see that in the film I had no idea that was based on a real event. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I think he won a medal for that, actually, mm. if I remember rightly. It's been a little while since I, I researched it all, but it's such a great scene, and it captures that. So the, the pier for the airborne troops was a massive force multiplier. So obviously they, they managed to take six-pounder anti-tank guns and 17-pounders, but by that point in the battle, 17-pounders were being knocked out, the six-pounders were running out of ammunition, and they were down to piers. And that's the platoon anti-tank weapon where it's really important for an infantryman to have that anti-tank capability on hand, as you know, from your recent video on, um, on Sustrin and yes, um, of course. Herbert Howard's peer action. It's really important for soldiers to have that on hand when they can't call up support. And when you're cut off or you're ahead of the main body as, as they were, then peers become really important and they're a force multiplier in that it's a weapon you can call on instantly. Yeah, and Arnhem is one of the classic battles of the period because it was it was what they had, and mm. and uh, Dicky Lonsdale famously wrote in an after action report: um, if we'd had more peer ammunition and more peers, we could have held on till Christmas. Time and time again, the call was for peer ammunition. Yeah, um, and if they'd had more, they would have they would have clung on. And obviously, but... Major Kane wins his VC by exactly peer attacking Stugs. So. Yeah, it's, it's iconic, isn't it? So I think moving on, talking about Arnhem, keep it fresh in the fresh in our heads. Of course, it's 1977's uh, A Bridge Too Far. You bring it up, Rob. The, you doing bring it. it up. We get the iconic phrase, bring up the pier. I think it's probably no other weapon has got, you know, iconic line in a movie like the pier no. has. And I think it's the scene that perhaps, I mean, I, I know we've talked about it before outside of the show, but do you think that line of how the Piat is brought up, do you think that damages the Piat in, in a way that is remembered historically or, or in, in the discourse of history? Do you think that's damaged the Piat's reputation? It's interesting. I mean, it's I, I don't know whether a colonel would have called up the Piat anyway. I think the Piat probably would have been forward on the on the line ready to go. Um, I don't think it damages it. I think it gives it a really interesting place in history and it, it, it yeah. gives it a notoriety, doesn't it? 
especially within English audiences, British audiences. Quoted like so many times. Whenever you mention a P, it's, someone says it. I use it as a hashtag on Twitter for yeah. anything P related because it's just it's just synonymous now, isn't it? I love the scene. I love elements of it. And I think it's quite clever in that it shows some elements of the Peart's difficulty in using. Sure. When, when, when he takes that shot and it falls short by about 20, 30 yards. Yeah. Um, they're, not a, they're not a panther. Um, <laughs> it's a leopard mark one. Um, it falls a little bit short. And that was often something that they, they had trouble with when they were firing from uh, elevation. Sure. So there's there's a really interesting uh, account from Warsaw, actually, which we'll talk about Warsaw in a moment with another sure. film. But in Warsaw, um, and Louis Hagen actually mentions it as well. Yeah, no, I'm left. That it was quite difficult to judge where to aim when it was elevated. So if you're on a second floor or or higher, as as, as they were in the film, I think they were like two stories up. Yeah, they, like the top of, top of the building. Yeah, You're making a 50, 70 yard shot it's quite easy to, to misjudge the, the lead that you need to give. There are a number of accounts that talk about bombs falling short, and the film depicts that really well, actually. Um, mm. I think what the problem with that iconic scene is, it shows the Peart failing. The overriding thing about the Peart in Arnhem is that it did rather well, and that's better shown in the earlier scenes of the, the SS attack, Graveman's attack over the bridge, because the Peart's the very first thing that knocks something out. Yes, it is. Yeah, you get the. It's the armor of Bill Islemore who's firing the pit in those yeah. scenes, and it's. Um, I know you did a video on it on your channel, Matt. But he's taking out uh, soft skin vehicles. He's taking out little the SKDF armored cars, mm-hmm. and he's you know absolutely dropping rounds, pinpoint accuracy. I know that one of the, the the accounts of the making of the movie says he was so accurate he would drop the round where the pyrotechnic went off. So it would look like they were firing real rounds. Exactly. If you look at those scenes really closely, every time he either shoots just ahead of it, you can see there's a very purposefully placed like little bit of rubble Charge. Yeah. that goes up. And that's that's where they've hidden the pyro. Mm. And then in the second part of that first scene, well, the, not the first scene, but the bring up the pier scene, he fires again and it, it goes just ahead of the tank. Yeah. Again, it's illustrating that difficulty of firing from elevation and when a target's moving away from you. So one of the things that they... They, they realized from actual uh, field testing with the pit was it was actually really difficult to hit a target that was either moving towards you or, or reversing. Mm. It was fairly easy to hit one that was standing still. And it was sort of not too bad to, to hit a crossing target because you could, you could anticipate lead a little bit easier um, because the velocity of a pit bomb when it's fired, isn't the velocity of a bullet. So a bullet yeah. moves a lot quicker than a, than a, a pier bomb does because of its sheer size and the you know the, the amount of charge of that pushes it off the spigot so they're quite slow you can just watch it jump, like fly through the air and there's lots of accounts that talk about that um you could watch it waggle off down towards its target and see if it was going to hit or not and then you have to duck obviously because <laughs> <laughs> the early ones had a propensity to fire back little bits of debris at you yeah um but the thing with the thing with that is Islemore was hitting exactly where those bits mm. of debris were placed for the pyro. So it wasn't that the Peart was missing. He was hitting where he was aiming. Yeah. He was just told not to hit the tank for that scene. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's, I think it's good. I think that scene, the other scene with the Peart in it, not the iconic one, I think it's a better mm. representation personally of the Peart in use because it's, it's doing what it's meant to do, taking out, you know, just taking out vehicles rather well. And you don't see it obviously being cocked in a stupid no. way that you see in these documentaries that try to portray the pit as something that's oh not. yeah there's a there's a there's a history channel um i think it's weaponology uh there's one of those that and there's a there's a, a chap in an israeli um military museum who's over pulling the, the spring one. back and he puts it over his shoulder and oh. yeah it, it's it's oh god it's painful to look at it's cringe it is painful but yeah i that's that's fair scene is the better scene to represent how it would have actually probably performed you know placing bombs in the tray correctly things like that that exactly you see a number of positions they're firing it from indoors which you couldn't do with a bazooka or a panzerfaust because of backblast of Um, course yeah there is that too yeah you you see a number two slide a bomb in and then tap it home that's exactly what they would have done because there was two little guides that they slipped a a disc into that made sure that the piet bomb didn't slide out the tray when you aimed downwards (laughs) so it's there's little nuances that you don't 
unless you look for them in that scene, you don't kind of pick them up. Mm. But when I when I looked at it to to make that little video, I I noticed all these little things that were actually quite correct and, and were were quite accurate to how the pier probably would have been used in the battle. Hello, Robbie here. Did you know you can support the podcast on Patreon? Join the supporting cast today and gain access to exclusive perks such as discount codes, our monthly Patreon film votes, and the chance to get exclusive merchandise before anyone else. Search Fighting on Film on Patreon or find the link on our website. Thank you. Now back to the show. So moving on to a 1975 film called Paper Tiger starring David Niven. Now it this doesn't a bit seem different, yeah. a bit different. It doesn't seem like the sort of movie that would have a Piet sequence in it, but David no. Niven in the film plays this sort of Walter Mitty, you know, mm. every story is exaggerated type character. And there's a sequence where he's telling a tale of Daring Do in the Second World War. Um, and, and what's funny as well about this sequence is it cuts to the to the back to the Second World War. Um, and I thought Niven would be played by like a younger man, but no, it's it's like seven. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's sixty odd year old Niven. Yeah, sixty year old Niven <laughs> portraying himself. It is. It's great. Yeah, and he's saying how he single handedly knocked out a bunker, um, and he asks for a bazooka, and the PA gets bought up. So he does. Matt, do you want to go into more depth? He's telling his, um, I suppose his um, his charge, a young Japanese boy, he's looking after and and, and teaching um, this story about. France in 1944 and he, he talks about how he was a captain with the Grenadier Guards and they're pinned down by this bunker and he calls for a bazooka and he's handed the pier obviously because uh, it's one of those weird in, idiosyncrasies with film where the, the film armor has gone okay he's a Grenadier Guards officer this is a British scene he needs a British weapon for anti-tank okay so they've got bazooka in the in the in the script no worries. Yep. I'll bring the pier along. I'll, we'll just, that's what we'll use. It'll be fine. Um, and it's still referred to as the bazooka in, in the, um, in the film, but it obviously wouldn't have been uh, yeah. referred to that in, in, in British service at the time. And he, he picks that up, saunters off, jumps over some um, sandbags, runs forward into a, uh, a shell crater and takes aim at the, at the, at the bunker when shock horror, a German armored vehicle appears yeah, but it, it's it's actually worse than the the bridge too far leopard. It's actually a an M8 Greyhound mocked up to look German ish. It's just got loads of scrim net on it, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he knocks that out first, and then um, he takes out the bunker with uh, with a Mills bomb, very well placed Mills bomb that goes just through a tiny slot. And the whole the whole scene's like a pastiche of yeah, it's war like a commando it? it's book, great. sort of like a warlord comic where. You know, the Germans come out, put their hands up on mass, like, don't shoot Tommy, don't shoot Fritz. <laughs> You've got Niven with some point shooting with his Webley. It's all very, you know. Yeah, it's great. I love that. I actually really like that film. It's one of my favourites. It's a good Niven film. He's on form in it. Just, it's interesting just to see Niven use the pier. I think it's quite it's quite adorable, really. <laughs> I think that sequence is really... Yeah, I love it. I, it. You just would never expect at that point in his career for him to have like another little action yeah. sequence where he's with a pier. He's doing his he's doing his Niven-y co- comedy acting, isn't he? He's, he's not... Yes. Yeah, it's very... At that stage in his career, I think he just was known more for comedic roles. He was, he was David Niven playing someone. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like that sort of thing. Um, but it's, it's no, great, it's, though. It's, cracking little sequence yeah there's some w- really interesting bits about about that because when you look at the pier that he has it's got the white aiming line along the top of it which is correct and that would have been used for indirect fire because that was one of the extra things that the pier could do it was a secondary yep. role you could use it as a mortar so when you're aiming at something straight on you could reach out to about 110 yards mm-hmm. optimistically and and hope to hit your target and then another role that the pier had which is never shown in film, which is a real shame because it'd be amazing if it was. Be interesting, um, wouldn't it? You could you could use it as a indirect fire weapon. So you'd load it up as normal, and then you would tilt it up, say forty five degrees, fifty degrees. Then you would use it like a like a standard mortar, and that's where that little monopod comes in. And you can elevate right. using that. It was used quite extensively in Italy and in Northwest Europe. Uh, in that way, there's there's a number of accounts uh, in the fighting in the Po River Valley in Italy. Mm-hmm. And there's, there's accounts of it being used in, in uh, northern France where they they didn't have mortar support and they, they were trying to drive off some tanks that were advancing and they, they dropped in pier rounds instead. Mm. But 
Niven's pier, it's got the little like, white aiming line, but it doesn't have a butt pad. So there's no webbing butt pad and there's no webbing um, cheek rest, the gaiter right. that's round it. So it's missing those. Really interestingly, the bomb that he puts into the actual um, support tray is, is a drill use. So it's got a yellow right. band. And then actually, if you look really close, it has drill use painted yeah. inside the, the <laughs> yellow band. And the only other thing from that scene that really stands out is when he when he runs forward, he has a spare pier bomb. It's it's attached to the back of his belt. It's like hanging off his webbing belt, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, it's quite did, a, yeah. Did, they would never do that, obviously, because no, that's quite dangerous. Quite a bad yeah. idea. <laughs> yeah. um, they were carried in little cardboard tubes. Plays into that commando book esque thing. You can imagine Absolutely. Like a guy wearing like a sort of bandolier. Like a bandolier full of them or something. Full of them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Rambo, you know. That was, I think that would have been funny if you had that as well. It would have been. It would have been completely inaccurate, but very funny. Just interesting to see a little comedy PE sequence because we don't really get anything like that in any other movie. No. So, yeah, moving on to a more serious use of the pier, um, we have uh, Warsaw 44, which is a, a Yang, is it Komsoma? Is that the director's name? I think I'm pronouncing that I think so. I, I, it's yeah. been a while since I've looked into it. But, yes, Miasto 44 or City 44 or Warsaw 44 as it was released um, for the English market. A really interesting film. It's very, the mise-en-scene, it feels amazing, actually. It mm. feels very, very much like, uh, a city under siege and, and lots yeah. of desperate battles and fighting and there's some really great choreographed sequences and one of them is uh, a peer takes on a, a Goliath remote controlled mine the home army they're all they all have small arms mm. like there's some captured MG42s captured car 98s in the sequence I think one of the guys got PPS 43 41 41 yeah got yeah. to have a share and then one of them has a, a Sten gun that's been dropped in they have the peers and yep. the pits were their only real anti-tank weapon other than Molotovs. And mm. again, it's a force multiplier massively. Yeah, of course. Because we, we dropped these in as many as we could during the fighting. One weapon's not going to turn the tide on a, on a situation that they found themselves in. Mm. So it was a, a really desperate battle. Very brave. It captures that really well because they only have small arms against this, this Goliath that's coming forwards. Yep. And they all open fire and, and try and knock it out to no avail. And it... You just think, God, that must have been terrifying to know something with such destructive force was coming towards you and you can't stop it. Mm. Um, you know, with a tank, it's impersonal, but you know there's people inside it and they're vulnerable. But when yeah. it's remote controlled, it's so small and it's armoured, it's even worse, isn't it? Yeah, it's like disembodied, um, isn't it? It's like a it's like a phantom type of thing. Yeah, it's, you, it's it? scary. I Faceless. Mean, it, when you watch it, you think... Destructive nonetheless. And it it rumbles forward and they, they finally decide to take it on with the peer. And we get the, the only depiction of the pier being cocked in film. Yes, that's a great little sequence, yeah. So we see the number one, and he's he's cocking it in the standing position. You could cock it lying down if you needed to from cover, mm -hmm. but typically you would do it from standing because it was easier. So he has the the, um, the the butt pad between his two feet, and he's twisted and unlocked the uh, the body of the pier from the, from the butt plate. And the way it worked is the big spring inside would be compressed for the first shot, um, by lifting up the body of the of the pit against um, the end plate of the of the body, and that would compress it inside, and then you'd lower it back down, lock it into place, and you'd be ready to fire. Because the kind of like uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a um, something similar that you could compare that to. It's kind of like a BB gun. So you know, you know, when you pull back the slide on a on a BB gun, you're compressing that spring. Yeah. Um, kind of a bit like that, uh, and then. You, you see him put the, the, the pit on the parapet and, and he fires and he manages to, to knock off a track and up, upturn the, the Goliath and it explodes. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really well done scene, actually. And then yeah. you realise the futility of even that success because a lot of them are killed in, in the firefight that follows. But it's, a, it's a really uh, worthwhile film to, to, to check out and look for, even if it's just for the pit scene. I, I found it really interesting. It's a great... Um, way of learning that the pit wasn't just used by the British, it was also used by the Polish as well. Absolutely. Commonwealth forces as well, so Australians, um, Canadians, New Zealanders, Indians, everyone in the, the British yeah. Commonwealth at the time, all the Commonwealth armies were issued with the pit as well. And I suppose it's worth saying that it went on to be used quite a while after the war as well. So it was famously used during um, uh, the early uh, Israeli conflicts. It was used by the Haganah. Mm -hmm. It was used by both sides, actually, during that war. Um, yeah. 
and uh, it was actually used in Indochina, and it was used yes. by the Dutch in Indonesia. It did have a bit of a post-war career. I think it, they went out to Korea, didn't they? Because that there's some conjecture on that. There's one. certainly a little bit of video footage we've seen um, yeah. where there's some guys uh, from from the, the brigade carrying one. Yeah, down 20, the road. I think they're 29th Infantry Brigade. Don't quote me. Probably mm. I might be wrong off the top of my head. That you know the, the, the same brigade, the Gloucesters. I, can't remember. I have it. I have it written down somewhere. But yes, yeah, they they, they definitely it definitely appears in that little bit of footage. They were there, but they didn't get used, unfortunately. Um, yeah, most most of them were were apparently uh, replaced in theatre by uh, M20 super bazookas. Yeah, they would have been like a, a sort of a, if we needed them, if we had to use them type deal. I yeah. think I did find when I was writing the book, I did find one account of a jeep. Uh, being driven by some engineers, were engineers uh, that that had a couple in and some uh, okay, some uh, ammunition, and it it overturned, and oh, they were right. talking about the contents were spilled across the road, that kind of thing. Uh, okay, um, so there's there's little glimpses of it being in Korea, but there's never any any accounts of it being used. There's even actually the latest, the very latest account of it being used is in um, the Indo-Pakistani War in 1971. Oh wow! Well, okay, that there's, there's a suggested account which I think is probably apocryphal, where it, uh, the Indians used it against some uh, Pakistani tanks. Okay, um, but I've tried and tried and tried to to get an actual source on that, so it, it didn't make it into the book because I couldn't prove it. Um, but it'd be amazing to find out if that was true. Mm. But aside from uh, Miasto Forty Four, Warsaw Forty Four, there's also Canal from 1957. There is, yeah. Yeah, which um, which is a fantastic film, really is, mm. um, and that has a little scene where a beautifully mocked up uh, wooden pit is used as a prop. Um, they would go through all the motions. They set it up on a parapet. There's a there's a T thirty four coming, which is mocked up to look like a, a tiger or a panther. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's like a panther mock up again. Comes it comes over a crest in a, in what looks like a quarry. Uh, they panic. They set up the pit and um, they they slot in a little carved wooden pit bomb into the prop pit it's great i love it it's really so, cute it, isn't it yeah it is it's brilliant and it fires off and there's a little bit of pyro and the smoke comes out it's a nice little effect and then on the second shot they knock it out and, brilliant. It, and the tank retreats great little scene canals another another film that we need to cover in the future because it's a really interesting film we do so apart from those scenes we've mentioned are there any honorable mentions that you want to highlight before we move on to our top representation uh well the on, the only other one that i would mention is uh the the scene in uh, Wistram in longest day that beautiful sequence of where the french commandos keepers commandos are attacking the casino and they they can't they can't knock out that gun mm-hmm. and they have a crack at it with the pit before he he makes his famous dash to bring up a, a dd tank that's one of my favorite scenes in that film. I, I love the cinematography and the way that that shot, that assault is shot initially. And then to cap it all, we get a pit scene. That aerial shot is one of the greatest sequences in war movie oh, it's, cinema. I, it's, I love it so much. It's so mm. beautifully done. Not many uh, films that try and portray a, like a, an attack like that. The so chore- well choreography of that yeah. was must have been really something to, to put together. Yeah. But yeah, there's there's a little scene where they, they fire off the pit and it doesn't manage to... To knock it out and that's true the casino that they represent that looks nothing like the actual casino as it would have looked during d-day because the casino had been knocked down in like 42 yeah um and it was just a bunker they converted the the um the lower portion of it into a into a bunker the bit where the, they're all on the roof and it looks a little bit weird because of the building's like two-thirds scale so they're on the roof with that mg and it just doesn't look quite right but they did, in fact, try and knock out a bunker um, during the actual assault with the Piet, but they couldn't penetrate. Right. So that, that comes from an actual real event. Uh, so it's really nice that they included that. So that's that's my honourable mention for, for the picks. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. So, Matt. You are a Piet man, you're a Piet expert. If you haven't read Matt's book on the Piet, I highly suggest you seek out a copy. What do you think is the greatest representation of the Piet on film to date? I like the can out the bag early, didn't I, when I said that it you was did. probably theirs is the glory, <laughs> but it is theirs is the glory. It's a depiction of the Piet on screen, being used by men that have been trained to use it, knew how to use it, 
knew how it would have been deployed, knew how it was supposed to be held, fired, not actors that have been trained by an armorer or an mm-hmm. armorer himself in, in Islemore's case with uh, Ridge Too Far, but real guys that had been trained during the war, knew how it was supposed to be used, and they they represent how it would have been used in the actual battle. And it's yeah. it's just something really special about that, knowing that it was men that were in the battle representing how it would have been used on the day. It's it's really special. No, I tend to agree. I mean, obviously, A Bridge Too Far has a special place in my heart because of the bring up the Piat line and it, its cultural significance and it's how I think that, you know, the Piat is sort of, a, it has this elongated life through that movie. But yeah, it has to be there. This is the glory, doesn't it? it just, just for those reasons you've brought up, it's just, it's so special. It's it, it Yeah, exactly. And it's so special because it features twice in two, one scene, which is, really cool because they're knocking yeah. out a French tank that's been conveyed into a flamethrower tank and it's holding up the advance. Which is really then, accurate for Arnhem because they were bought up and Louis Hagen writes about, yeah. you know, being attacked by the Sharby flamethrower tanks and they were devastating. Um, so that's another re- way that that scene is good as well because it's showing at an actual properly, you know, an actual like, AFE that they came up against. Mm-hmm. And then we yeah. get a little bit of humour with Dixon's scene. Yeah. It's just brilliant. And where else are you going to see a peer? actually fire and hit a panther tank on film i think so i love that film and that is one of the scenes that just go it just blows my mind yeah. that they had these knocked out tanks that were still there for the battle there to be used as props for the film and they made full use of it just incredible really so yeah that's matt and mine's favorite representation of the p on screen and we want to know yours so yeah. at some point this week we'll run a p at poll and you can vote on your very own your favourite scene. Um, so check out the Twitter for that one. And I want to thank Matt for being our guest this week um, on the pier. You know, his his knowledge just isn't war movies. He actually knows his stuff about weapons as well. Um, <laughs> it's his job. Um, it's his literal job, folks. So thanks for that, Matt. And thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll take any any chance to talk about pits. Everyone knows this by now, surely. He will, he will. So, yeah, thanks for sticking with us for this special experimental format episode. If you liked it, please let us know um, on Twitter, Facebook. Um, email us at um, fightingonfilm at gmail as well. We, we, you know, we'd love to hear your thoughts. And as always, you can like, share, comment on the podcast, on our socials. And next week, we will have Robert Lyman with uh, a look at 1961's The Long and the Short and the Tall. So that will be a treat. I can't wait. It's going to be really good, isn't it? And we'll catch you next week, guys. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye.